Today on Locked On Red Wings, Giannis and Berggren surprised many of us. But what kind of grade does that land him? Also, grading Ben Sherratt and Robert Haig. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty's a host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. And today, guys, we're gonna get back to those player grades that we were working on last week. Try to work our way through them. Scotty presented me with three players that he'd like to grade today, and I think they're good guys to go with. And I think the headliner on this one, being Jonathan Bergeron, is a good one. Really the sole rookie in this year, because you can't really count Edvinson or Casper for what they did. I mean, you guess you could probably count Elmer Soderblom. We'll make an exception, probably grade him. But like Bergeron was the one who joined the team partway through the season and stayed with the team throughout the rest of the year. But before we get to the player grades, Scotty, uh, just as a reminder of how this works, we tend to grade guys who played more than 20 games with the Detroit Red Wings. Like that was our bar. We kind of had to set it somewhere because if we lower that bar, we're grading like all the Grand Rapids Griffins players too. Yeah. Um, and then also they had to finish the year with the Red Wings. That does include guys who were hurt. So guys like Zadina, Robbie Fabry, we'll, uh, we already did Zadina, but we'll get to Fabry eventually. They, were injured, but they were still on the roster, just on the IR. So we'll get to those guys as well. And also, these grades are completely arbitrary. You know, they don't really mean much of anything. They're just our grades, and we're basing them off of our expectations for that individual player at the beginning of the season. And I think a good place to start, Scotty, I mean, obviously we talk about our headliner, right? Jonathan Bergen's our headliner uh, in – in this episode and talking about expectations, I think expectations for Jonathan Bergen was make the team have an impact. And he did that this season, you know, he finished ninth in points, top 10 on the team. So not great. You know, usually you carry what 22, 23 guys on your roster, two of those being goaltenders. Uh, he finished right in the middle and that's 28 points in 67 games, 15 goals, 13 assists. Um, that gives him, has him finishing, uh, I'm sorry, let me filter that one more time. Fifth on the team in goals as well. So, Jansen Berggren, when it comes to him, Scotty, for me, if I guess I'll leave this off, um, I got to give him a solid B. I think that the rookie deserves a, a B. He was better than expected, but then struggled a little bit uh, near the end of the season, point production-wise. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great way to describe it, and I'm also going to go with a B here. I, I, I think... Uh, when looking back at what we wanted to see from him this season, like you said, we just wanted to see him. Like that was really the, the the simplest way to put it. Like we just wanted to see him on the ice and get a legitimate opportunity. And he certainly did almost played in 70 games this season. And uh, like you said, I mean, not, not horrible production wise. And, and I think honestly, if he had maintained his production, like pre new year into the second half of the season, that grade could only get higher. Like it's, it's really fascinating looking at his season. You know, we've done this with a few other players, but breaking it down month by month. So November and December, he has six points and seven points respectively, January five points and his plus minus, which again, huge grain of salt to plus minus as a stat in a whole is exactly zero on January 1st. Okay, so he is a, a zero plus minus player. And at that point had what math 17, 18 points right, right around January 1st. And then after that, January, he gets a uh, well, actually, we can go to February 1st because that's he also had a zero in, in, uh, in plus minus in January. Then February, he gets uh, only three points, no assists the entire month of February. And then March, he only gets three points as well and has a negative 13 plus minus in one month of hockey. That's almost minus one a game, which is not a very good clip, obviously. 
Uh, and then April kind of ended the season on, on a relatively high note and uh, scored a couple of goals down the season. So it, it's just fascinating, you know, looking at the first half, second half. You can almost cut the season right in half for him, just like we've talked <laughs> right. about, honestly, with a lot of other players on this hockey team. And, uh, and say, you know, if he just maintained – and it wasn't even like he was, you know, like setting the world on fire or anything in the first half. But if he maintained that pace throughout the entire season – uh, you, we could be even talking about a, a B plus or an A minus, but a B by no stretch of the imagination is is a bad clip. I agree with you. I, I think that I'm going to put it right there as well. Um, and yeah, I, I think the only other thing from here on out for me is just how much of a goal scorer can we get out of them? Like that's really, and, and, and that's going to be the my question for a lot of these young players, but we talk about it a lot. This team desperately needs some players to step up and be, like goal scores and really fill the back of the net. And uh, he showed flashes at times for sure, had some really nice goals, had, had some stretches uh, in the season uh, where he had some some pretty uh, – a decent goal-scoring clip. But uh, the season as a whole, what, 15 goals? 15 13? goals, yep, for yeah. fifth on the team. So, yeah, you know, rookie season, solid start, B grade, and, and hopefully we're building up from there and that can kind of be the new benchmark and – we could maybe get a, a a mid or high 20 goal score out of him soon. Yeah, I mean, he's in such an easy B for me because if we consider B like an exceeding expectations but not like blowing you out of the water type, I think that's the perfect fit for him because he came in and we weren't really sure what to expect out of him, but he came firing at all cylinders for lack of a better yeah. you know analogy there. And he scored goals. He made plays happen. He was hungry. He was forcing turnovers, driving plays. He was doing everything. And when he first joined the team, it was like, holy smokes, he's the real deal, which we thought for the longest time. I mean, we thought he should have finished the year with the Red Wings last season. But this year, um, he came up and he did exactly what we were hoping Jonathan Bergeron would do. Then in the second half of the season, as the year progressed, and like a lot of the players on this team we've talked about, things began to kind of cool off. The team kind of found its level. Jonathan Bergen kind of ran into a wall where teams were figuring out his play style and he was struggling to produce more. But that being yeah. said, how many times down the stretch, Scotty, did we talk about how Jonathan Bergen was making the bottom six so much better? And that's another thing to consider too, is he at one point had earned top six minutes because yeah. he was playing so well. By the end of the season, he was playing bottom six with guys who could not, either finish a finish what he was setting up or B set him in, up into a position to succeed either yet. He was still making as a winger. Those lines look so much better than they really were. I mean, how many times Scotty did we come on here after a loss and talk about how one of the only lines that produced was like your Zarnik Bergen line. And a lot of that had to do with one Zarnik is a bit of a dog. He wasn't afraid of, you know, fighting for he that puck, but dog. Bergen did such a fantastic job of setting up, his teammates and driving play. There were so many times he would get that puck to a uh, teammate in the slot and they just could not finish because they didn't have the talent, but Bergen would put them in a position to succeed. And if you look at his player card on evolving hockey, he was a plus offensively and defensively this season and often, and he was a plus on the power play. He was a expected goals above replacement of four uh, even strength offense, but in reality only finished at about a two. So if you look at the metric and this is what I'm talking about, he, by the expected goals above metric, he should have finished better than in reality what he did. And a lot of that, again, I think has to do with the linemen that he was playing with defensively. He was a positive plus uh, on the power play. He was a plus. He didn't get any shorthanded time. Really actually not at any at all. He took more penalties or he didn't take more penalties. Um, he didn't take a lot of penalties. The only thing is he was, Bad at drawing penalties, so to speak, whatever that means, according to this hockey player card. I mean, he was a plus player for the Detroit Red Wings, and that was more than we could hope for. Yeah, the production fell off in the second half, but that's to be expected of a rookie, right? Like, you kind of expect them to hit a little bit of a wall. There's very rare situations where a rookie comes in, he starts off hot, and he stays hot throughout the entire season. It's just, it doesn't happen. Even Lucas Raymond hit a bit of a wall last year. So, I mean, this is just... He exceeded expectations, but he didn't blow us out of the water to like deserve a solid A. But everything we saw out of him was promising enough to warrant that solid B. And that is a good grade on this yeah. team to earn. 
Yeah, for sure. I also found it interesting that um, like this is for each individual player, for the most part, you're going to see like fairly captain obvious statement. But like when you compare their stats and wins to stats and losses, like obviously most players, you know, if you're winning games, you're going to produce more. But there are some like the top end talent, like, you know, we expect Dylan Larkin to show up pretty much every night for the most part. And the, kind of the the same conversation for a different reason for like the the fourth liners or third pairing defensemen or, or whatnot just as far as production goes like you expect about the same from them every night but Bergeron is is really fascinating to me because uh he had 18 points in 27 games in which the Red Wings won which is over a half point a game clip and in losses total, he was he played in 33 games in which the Red Wings lost. Okay, total points scored in those 33 games four. <laughs> so like, if you want to highlight someone on this team, like in middle six, it makes sense, right? Like your 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 top line, you expect you know you want to lean on them every night. Your fourth line, you're not gonna go into an, uh, any game thinking like the fourth line is gonna be the reason we win. So it makes sense that the middle six players are like really vital and important to team success. Like that's again, fairly obvious, but it is really fascinating that he goes from over half a point a game player to like almost just completely unproductive in, in, in losses. So another guy just as we go into next season it is going to be really, really key for the Red Wings to take a step forward is his production being consistent and taking another step forward. Absolutely. Uh, so we got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to move on to the ever polarizing Ben Sherratt. So stay tuned to Lockdown Red Wings. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about game time. Game time is the place for last minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps, and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Segment two, Locked On Red Wings podcast. Scotty and I are talking about the uh, Ben Sherratt now. We're going to move on to talking about Ben Sherratt and giving him a grade this season. This is the first year on his four million, uh, four year, four point two five million dollar deal. And I mean, from the get out, Scotty, this was a controversial contract, and we weren't the only ones saying that. A lot of people thought that this might be. We put some faith in Steve Eisman because he had earned it, and we were. But we doubted it. We we did have our faith was a little bit shaken on that one. Not to say that we should be able to criticize Steve Eisman and the moves he makes, but for whatever reason, Ben Chirot, and we've talked about this so much, Ben Chirot is really highly respected in NHL teams and in, in front office circles. And I kind of understand why, uh, because he does bring a massive leadership aspect to the team, and that should that should not be thrown out when talking about Ben Chirot and what he brings. But if we're talking about on ice product. I mean, we talk about expectations and how we're going to be grading that. I can't see how a minus 31 on this team can be given a very high grade. He finished the year with 19 points in 76 games, five goals, 14 assists. Doesn't really matter too much for a defenseman. When we're talking about Ben Chirot, Scotty, I first of all, what even was our expectation? Because I don't even I don't even quite remember what our expectation for Ben Chirot was. I first, can tell what you, we but got. you're not going to be happy. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the expectation was upon signing that he was going to be the uh, on Siders pair. And that was going to like work. Like that was, we, we talked about it a lot. And even when we had our hesitations, as you said, we were like, okay, well, we're going to give Eiserman, I guess, the benefit of the doubt here. Like this is kind of confusing. He hasn't really been good in a couple of seasons at this point, but 
maybe the the we, we you know how we talked about how Mata and Heronic were so good together. We were like, oh, maybe like this can be a situation where Cider is the the kind of more agile defenseman and makes a lot of plays and is really effective offensively, but also, you know, is really good defensively, obviously. And Chirac can be more of like the physical presence that this team is lacking. And I mean, we could just say it like that didn't really happen. And by the end of the season, he was on the third pair, like at points, you know what I mean? Like it, it started with, uh, he started at the top and then they, they finally switched it and moved Wallman up to, to be, uh, a, a pair in a pairing with cider and Sherratt had moved down to the second. And then at one point he was on the third and then he ended the season at the very end. He was kind of the, the pair mate with, um, Simon he was the Edvinson. mentor, the mentor. Yeah. Right. With, with Edvinson. So, uh, it, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. Cause I, I mean, he objectively did not live up to what, was bestowed on him on opening night, which again was, even if he's not great, uh, he's going to be a, a first pairing defenseman with Moritz Sider on this team, but they were so bad together. The two of them were so bad together that they didn't even make it to February uh, before they had to split that pairing up. And and they did not play together again for the remainder of the season. So it's it, it's tough for me to give it him anything more than... I mean, goodness, I, I guess I'll go. <laughs> it's either a D or a D minus for me. And I'm kind of going back and forth in my head. How, it's Honestly, like how the only hesitation I have to, to just give him like a D minus or an F outright is probably the fact that like weirdly helping his grade is the fact that when we signed him, I was hesitant. <laughs> like that might, that might be the only thing even somewhat saving his grade just because these are based off of expectations. Um, I, I don't know how you can give him anything more than a D minus or a D at absolute most. I'll give him a D uh, simply for I'm the, fine with that. for the, 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 the saving grace for him in my book that keeps him from getting a failing grade is just the, the leadership quality that he does bring. And I know that doesn't warrant 4 million by four years and it doesn't justify it, but it cannot be, it cannot be undersold how important that was to the locker room. Because when you hear guys in the locker room, talk about Ben Chirot, it's nothing but glowing reviews. Yeah, like correct. he is without a doubt, a leader that this team desperately needed. I mean, the guys you brought into the locker room, became the leaders on this team. And that clearly was a, a, a point of a, that Eisman wanted to address this offseason is the leadership in the locker room. Because if you look at who wore the A's for the majority of the season, I know Cider uh, in the preseason wore, I know Rasmussen at one point even wore an A, but it was the bulk majority was a cycle between Perron, Sherratt, and Andrew Kopp. And those three guys are veterans that you brought in to be leaders. And Ben Sherratt was a leader amongst leaders in that locker room. That's why he gets a passing grade. That being said, I brought up on ice product and you brought it up. I mean, he was comfortably worse on the team in plus minus. And again, that's not, that's a team stat. Yes. But when you're, when you're a minus 31 and the next worst player is net minus 17. And also like you're that's changing who you're, you're, like pairing mate is the throughout the season. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it'd be one thing if it was like, Oh, like, yeah, him and his whoever is is alongside him are at the bottom. Like they weren't a good thing, but like he he changed who he was paired with multiple times throughout the season and still found himself comfortably at the bottom. It's it's like as I was saying, it's I know plus minus is a team stat, but when it's that when it's that skewed, clearly something that this player is doing is the problem. Right. And we saw it with the Moritz Sider Ben Sherratt pairing, and you know we hear a little bit about it, or maybe I, I don't want to. What, from what it seemed to me, in my opinion, my subjective opinion, is it had a lot to do with the chemistry. Moritz Sider and Ben Sherratt were just on different wavelengths. Ben Sherratt would take himself out of the play trying to chase a hit, which is something we were warned about. Moritz Sider would try, then have to try and cover something he right. shouldn't have had to do. Now he's playing, and I remember it might have been ineffective math, or maybe Prashant posted a graphic of like the amount of times Mort Sider was playing off it on his offside because he was covering for Ben Chirot, who had been caught. Funnily enough, 
Moritz Sider, I'm sorry, not Mount Moritz Sider, but Ben Chirot's best pair at even strength, expected goals, four percentage and Corsi four percentage. So shot attempt and shot attempt, quality shot attempt percentage at even strength. His best pair was actually with Moritz Sider. And that yeah. was at his expected goals for expected goals, four percentage at even strength was 43.59, which is still getting like hammered night in and night out. His next best pair was Ben Chirot with Philip Ronick. That was 43.65. Below that was Ben Sherratt and Olimata, which was 36.55. And those six games he played with Simon Edison was 38.27. So there was not a single pair where Ben Sherratt, when on the ice, was creating more scoring chances for the team than was letting up. And I understand, again, like even that is a team statistic. I could change it to relative if you want. If I change it to relative, it's not going to look great on him either. And I don't mean to make this like, anti bencher I don't mean to make him a scapegoat, but if we're going to be honest, like it just, we wanted him to be a top pair defenseman with Moritz Sider and his job was to eat minutes. And all he did on the ice with Moritz Sider was like make Sider. And again, Sider, Sider has responsibility in this too, but made Sider look worse. And yeah. well, I mean, we gave Sider a B. It's not like we yeah. went out there and gave Sider like an A plus and we're like, Oh, the only thing in his way was Ben Sherrod. Like this isn't, this isn't, you know, Ben Sherrod is certainly not the, uh, the the sole reason or probably even majority responsible for the fact that this defense is still in the current condition that it's in. There are still a, a lot of holes and reasons as to why this defense uh, is is not where a lot of people want it to be. Um, but that's also, when, though, devil's advocate, he does block a lot of shots. And I do respect the hell out of him for that. Yeah, no, that's I mean, one that, aspect that, of his yeah. game I really respect. And again, like that, that's, that's why, again, like we're, we're both kind of in that boat of, of giving him a, a D and rather than like an outright failing grade. Cause there is some things that he brings to the team. It's just certainly not worth so far one year into it, what this contract is at the moment. Um, and yeah, he's, I, I would imagine that he's probably not going to be getting too many first pairing minutes for the remainder of his three years here. Absolutely. So we're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about another defenseman, Robert Haig, another one of those cyclical seventh demon. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about Athletic Greens. This next partner is a product you got to use literally every day. Start taking AG1 because with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, focus, and aging, all those things. It's lifestyle friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything while still tasting good. It was created when the owner was expecting or experiencing a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to cover, and it cost him over $100 a day. But by creating Athletic Greens, the same result is going to cost you less than $3 a day. It's cheaper than that cold brew habit, and you're investing in your health. And it also has over 7,000 five-star reviews, which doesn't hurt either. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Segment three, Locked on Red Wings podcast. Scotty, we're going to move on now and talk about Robert Haig. He's a little bit of a tougher one to grade, I feel. One, because like, how do you grade a seventh D-man, right? Like, How do you accurately grade somebody who didn't play? He only played 38 games this season. I'm going to say his points, but that doesn't matter. He had seven points in 38 games, two goals, five assists. Who cares about any of that? That doesn't that doesn't matter. He didn't even play enough uh, to warrant an overall percentile rank on evolving hockey. Like, that's how little he played. That being said, like, you talk about oh. bringing in a guy. Like, you brought him in the offseason to serve as, like, a rotational seventh D-man. I mean, that was the expectation. And I think you had to use him more than you probably hoped that you would because of the fact that Gustav Lindstrom just failed to really lock down that spot. But I mean, he served his role, right? Like what do you, what do you, how do you assess Robert Haig? 
I think you nailed it right there. Like I, I think you. I, I remember when we brought him in and when we, uh, when we signed him in the off season, how that was the conversation. It was like, okay, like this is a dude that. Uh, did we give him a two way? I think we gave him a two way off rip, and uh, it was one of those things where we were like, okay, well, this is one of the things that Eisman. Ri- yeah, one way. It was one way. Okay, so this was one of the things that Eisman really wanted to address was like, what was was depth, and and we talked about it so much last off season, uh, which seems like forever ago, but that was such a consistent conversation you and I were having on here last summer, where it was like, okay, this team really fell off to not this past season, obviously, but two seasons ago when. They got really thin with injuries, and they didn't really have anyone that was able to step up. And so Iserman made it a point to bring in a lot of depth pieces, a lot of of, of guys like Robert Haig, a lot of two way contracts, etc., because so so that he wouldn't find himself in that same situation. We're like, okay, a couple of injuries, and this team's just completely uncompetitive. And not that Robert Haig is is going to go out there and. Uh, be the the reason that you win or lose a lot of hockey games, but um, I, I think that he was he was pretty much exactly what you signed up for. But the reason that I'm going to give him a C plus is because I, I think that to your point and and you you said exactly what I was thinking. I think you used him probably a lot more often than you anticipated going into the season with almost 40 games played. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is a, a nice like C plus for me just because of the usage and he wasn't a, a liability out there. He filled the role. He did exactly what uh, was was asked of him when we brought him in. You know, that's that's the role that we wanted him to fill. And and he did it for almost half of the entire season. Yeah, I, I have no complaints. I know it's a one year deal, eight hundred thousand dollars. So I, I don't think. <laughs> you realistically can bring him back. I'm sure you can no, probably I, yeah. upgrade. You can upgrade that position in the free agency this year without having to pay a whole lot more. Uh, only a minus five doesn't really matter a whole lot. Technically, no single player on this team. There's only like one player on this entire roster that had an above 50 Corsi or expected goals for percentage. It seemed this all, all year long. He was comfortably below 50% as well. Uh, but if you filter that via relative and apparently I closed out of natural stat trick, but I, I remember looking before he was like fourth on the team of the guys we're going to grade in relative expected goals for percentage. So as a seventh D man with his limited minutes, you got to remember two smaller sample sample size compared to guys like Moritz cider. But when he was on the ice, the team was better, was getting more opportunities in the offensive zone than in the defense uh, having opportunities against them in the defensive right. zone. If I'm, if I'm saying that cleanly enough, he was a positive asset on the ice technically at the end of the season relative to his teammates, not by a whole heck of a lot, but he was, and that's because he's a defensively sound defenseman. And one of the things he's pretty dang good at is zone entry denials, which is something that this team as a whole is not very good at. <laughs> uh, but I remember, seeing a, yeah. I remember seeing a graph partway through the season, and granted, a lot of it had to, again, do with sample size. But there was a graph for defensemen, and it was it had all like a lot of defensemen from across the NHL, but there was one guy who was like comfortably in the upper right hemisphere. I don't think that's the right word. Quadrant of this graph. Hemisphere, yeah. Hemisphere. Quadrant of this graph, and that was like, strong zone entry denials and someone was like oh was that cider please tell me that was cider it's like no it's robert haig robert haig is like the king of zone entry denials i think that was like 12 games played and that's what i think it was a jay fresh graph even he was or might have been ineffective math and he even needs of like sample size but it was it was insane to see that robert haig had that kind of impact for me he's a c plus i mean he i don't think you bring him back just because of you know you can upgrade that position but i was not aboard uh, you know i was not horrified watching him play when he was on the ice i was like okay well we'll we'll be okay he was a player you didn't really notice and that was a good thing yeah for a for a sixth or seventh d man you don't really want to notice too much i think so uh yeah i i agree c plus all the way um again if we're for if all these are are relative based, to our expectations right relative to our expectations i i think that a c plus is pretty fair for him um we agreed on every single one down to like the plus and the minus. You got to, we got to fight about something, man. What are you, what are we doing? 
Uh, what can we fight about? Do you have any crap takes? <laughs> any, any, anything you want to air out here? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I think all my takes are... Crap? Yeah, me too. Wow. Okay. Wasn't going there. You pause. I, you pause when you shouldn't have. No, no. I think you're speaking for a lot of people, I think, with that. I don't know. I don't know if I have anything to really fight about off the dome here. I mean, fight about how big your head is. It's large. It's a problem. I, I can't buy hats. It's Who that was big. it in the Tigers dugout the other day? They hit a home run, and the, the Red Wings helmet that they used like, wouldn't fit on his head because his head was too large. Yeah, Should... I think that was Tyler Nevin. Oh, yeah. He's, he's back in Toledo now, so he won't have to wear that for a little bit. But... He doesn't have to worry about that problem, hitting home runs for the Tigers. Yeah, not very many people do worry about that <laughs> problem, apparently. Yeah. But, hey, they eclipsed their win total for last April. Yep. Ten wins, right? Yeah. That's three better. Yeah. Things are looking up. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> I mean, actually, today's episode for Tigers is like the one month, because we have an off day on Monday, so it's like the one month recap, like, you know, where everybody stands right now thing. And Yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right. I guess we'll end the episode there. Verlander and Scherzer coming into town, both to face the Tigers this week. That's awesome. That is actually pretty cool. You're going to get, I'm sure, a lot of fans at Comerica Park just to watch that. To watch us get blanked twice? Yeah, that's cool. Uh, fan favorites, dude. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, I would like a team that brought them to the park and hit off them would be cool. You're watching the wrong team. I trust me, brother. I'm well aware. <laughs> if you want offense, you are definitely watching the wrong team. If you're watching us, that's for but you'll sure. get pretty good pitching, apparently. Yeah, she's been bad. pretty good. All right, uh, we'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. I don't know if we'll continue. Maybe we'll break up the player grades again. Maybe we'll keep doing player grades. I don't know. We haven't decided yet. So stay tuned for a surprise on Lockdown Red Wings. Scotty, any final thoughts? We ball. All right, same time, same place. Your team every day. Every day. <laughs>